Hey guys, this is John. Just wanted to draw your attention to a high quality opening repertoire that is up for publication on Chessable. And that repertoire is The Practical Slav Defense by international master Tom Bartel. I've had the pleasure of playing Tom a couple times. Strong player, good analyst. He has previously published a repertoire on the Karakon Defense on Chessable. So those of you who like this repertoire will probably like the Slav Defense repertoire that he's published as well. The Karakon repertoire, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, Tom's publishing credentials, has a five-star rating and about 130 students right now. Lots and lots of positive feedback in the comments. I don't play the Karakon myself, really, outside of a disaster I suffered in a Blitz game a couple uh, days ago against a Grandmaster. But if I were looking into the Karakon, this is certainly a repertoire I'd check out. And I mention this because Tom makes a very good case for basing your repertoire around the move c6. So in the Karakon, e4, c6, black is playing c6 on move one. And in the Slav defense, black is playing c6 on move two. And as Tom explains, you can also end up playing c6 setups against openings like the English defense as well, or knight f3 on move one. So you can base um, a very large part of your repertoire around that move early on if you kind of strive for universality and uh, simplicity in the lines that you're looking at. So let's explore the Slav a little bit. I want to give you a brief overview of what the Slav is, and then we'll have a look at the repertoire as well. So this repertoire has over 150 variations, 11,000 plus words of instruction. And if we go to the chapter breakdown, you can see that it is 11 chapters. And the primary part of the repertoire is what to do in the Slav defense proper, which we'll look at in a second. But I want to point out that Tom also covers you know, the, the English lines that I was mentioning. So what to do if white plays c4 on move one, you can respond with c6 against that. Also in the side systems section, he covers non-Queen's Gambit options. So if white plays the London system or the Trumpowski, how do you meet that? I think it's always nice when you have a repertoire that goes into those sidelines and the author takes the time to explain what to do there, it just doesn't leave you hanging. So let's click on the introduction chapter. So the Slav defense is a defense to d4, and it deals with what to do against c4, the queen's gambit on move two. c4 is considered the principal try for an advantage against d5 on move one. And the Slav defense is initiated after c6. So unlike the move e6 on move two, with c6 you are supporting the center but not blocking your light square bishop. I think that's an important distinction to make right away. That's what's always appealed to me about the Slav, is that I can still get this light square bishop outside of the pawn chain in many lines. Usually you're developing it to f5. Whereas if you play e6 on move two, even though the queen's gambit declined, e6 does have a great reputation, you have to work harder with that light square bishop to get it out later. So c6, white typically brings their knights out now, knight f3 followed by knight c3. But Tom mentions that white also has c takes d5, the exchange Slav, at their disposal. And he discusses what to do against that. He recommends an early a6 in many of the main positions out of the exchange Slav. But if we go after knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, the Slav defense itself is characterized by black's next move, which is d takes c4. So capturing the pawn on c4. Now, I want to say right away, because this is a useful point of clarification for people, especially those who are unfamiliar, Black is not taking on c4 in the hopes of holding on to that pawn. Black is more so taking on c4 in the hopes of inconveniencing white and buying time for development. Okay, so with this next move a4, what white is doing is spending a move in order to stop b5. If white were to play e3 or e4, black can continue with b5 and defend the pawn on c4. So it's unfortunate from white's point of view that white has to do this. That's why I mentioned it's inconveniencing white. a4 stopping b5, but weakening some squares in the process, namely b3 and b4. And what does black do with this time that they've just been given? Well, they develop bishop f5. Black's not trying to hold that pawn. You're going to get in trouble if you do that. Instead, you're aiming for rapid development and solidity. That's the adjective that really comes to mind for me. Uh, the, the Slav is an extremely solid defense. Again, those of you who like the Karakon against e4, you'll love the Slav because inherently black just gets this nice pawn structure. Um, also, Scandinavian players 
If you like the Scandinavian, you'll probably like the Slav because you end up with a similar pawn structure with pawns on e6 and c6. So here, after this bishop f5 move, white has a choice. White will play either e3 or knight e5. Both moves are intended to try to recover the pawn on c4. And that's where we really get into the heart of the repertoire is what to do after those two moves. So again, just to recap, we're playing c6 on move two. This initiates kind of the Slav galaxy. And the Slav defense itself is characterized by d take c4 on move four. There's other lines like the semi-Slav where black is playing e6. There's also a6, which is kind of a hybrid system, but the Slav defense itself, which Tom is recommending in this repertoire is taking on c4. Now, if we go back out to the repertoire and just click on some of the chapters again, so you can see he talks about the exchange Slav, queen c2 and queen b3 on move uh, number four, which are kind of sidelines, although they have gained quite a bit of popularity in recent years. If we go to chapter four, I was curious what Tom was going to recommend in this chapter because I face this line a lot in Blitz and OTB chess. So in this chapter, he discusses the move e3 on move four for white. So this is a, a solid move in reply. It's a pretty reliable approach for white, whereby white defends the pawn on c4 with the bishop. But white does block in the dark square bishop is the downside to this move. And in this case, you actually will not be taking on c4 unless there's a clear reason to. You won't take on c4 here because white can smoothly recapture with the bishop and white hasn't had to play that a4 slightly weakening move in order to get that pawn back. So what Tom recommends here is bishop f5, again, getting that bishop outside the pawn chain. We're gonna try to close it by playing e6 after that. So pushing the pawn up. Now after knight c3, e6, the only move that really gives white any chance for an advantage is the next move, which is knight h4. White is trying to hunt down this light square bishop and obtain the advantage of the two bishops. And Tom recommends bishop e4. He even goes so far as to give this an exclamation point. And I already thought that was interesting because I've tried uh, bishop e4 as well as bishop g6 in this position. Bishop g4 is an alternative, although I don't think it's that great for black. And I always kind of wonder, like when I get to this position, which of these two moves is better? But Tom clearly prefers bishop e4. And as you can see from this line, one of the ideas here is that if white seizes the bishop, knight takes e4, which Tom gives a question mark. After d takes e4, white's knight on h4 is hung out to dry. Black is actually threatening g5 in this position, and that knight can easily get trapped. So white has to go through some contortions in order to save the knight. g3, allowing the knight to come back to g2. But Tom just gives a few more moves and concludes that black has a completely fine position, which... I've had this line in a tournament game before, and uh, yeah, I had absolutely no issues. So that's what he recommends against the E3 approach. Very popular line. Boris Avruk recommended it pretty famously in one of his books for quality chess a few years ago. So if we can explore some of the other chapters, let's go into the, so the main line here with E3. So in this variation, we're following the main moves again, where white brings out both knights, black strategically takes on c4, white plays a4 to stop b5, black is developing. And I think this just gives you an idea of how black likes to place their pieces. So e3, again, white prepares bishop takes c4, but in doing so blocks the dark square bishop. So kind of a trade off there. Black's just playing e6, setting up that pawn structure that you also see in the Karo Khan and the Scandinavian here. And now Black puts the bishop on b4. I like that move because that highlights the drawback of having played a4 if you're white. So white would love to have that pawn back on a2 so they could play a3 and challenge that bishop on b4. Uh, but since they already pushed it to a4, Black can nicely just nestle the bishop up there. Not necessarily with the intention of taking the knight, but... This indirectly influences the center as well because it's going to make it harder for white to play e4 later. Uh, after castles, you can see that black castles and hopefully black can play knight bd7 in the coming moves, develop their queen, and then later look for a break like c5 or in some cases even e5. So that's what you're doing in the e3 variations and there's still quite a bit of theory here, but Tom does an excellent job of, of going into that. So once again going to the main variations. Okay, so this is interesting. 
So what I think is the more ambitious move, and this seems to be the consensus among title players, is black playing for knight e5 on move number six. Instead of that e3 pawn move in this position, knight e5. And you can see based on Tom's explanation here, he calls it the modern Slav treatment. It looks weird that white is moving the knight again. However, this has the major benefit of not blocking the dark square bishop. Also, by vacating the f3 square, I've noticed in a lot of lines, white can play pawn to f3 followed by pawn e4 and attack this, this light square bishop, really try to obtain like a powerful pawn center. So if there's one major theoretical battleground in the Slav, I would say it's probably this one right now. And I think that will be the case for the years to come. And what's cool is that Tom recommends two different approaches against this move. And he gives all the analysis to back it up. So one of his recommendations is the so-called Sokolov line named after Ivan Sokolov, Dutch grandmaster. And that is playing knight bd7 here, allowing white to take on c4, but then playing knight b6, so looking for a knight trade. And if white wants any advantage, they usually have to play knight e5. In this particular line, Tom covers knight e3. But usually white will go back to e5, and then black will play pawn a5, which kind of secures the knight on b6, so white can't play here. But black is looking to exchange these knights. Knight b6 is offering the trade of knights, and... I had a game a few months ago where my opponent took on b6 in this position, but after I took with the a pawn, I didn't have any problems whatsoever. Since black does have a little less space than white, trades should favor black. So hence, you can kind of see the idea behind knight b6. So I thought it was interesting that he recommends that. And also, he recommends this line where you can end up sacrificing a piece for a few pawns. And this is an older line. I've never played this myself in an over-the-board game, but I'm always intrigued by it. Like, I always pay attention to games that I see here. And let me just see if I can kind of get into the heart of that recommendation. Yeah, so let's just say, like, this line, for instance. And again, this is still dealing with knight e5 on move 6. Now, instead of knight bd7, e6. If we click on this, we can kind of expand Tom's explanations. So he says, this natural move is a bit of a sideline these days. And it was popular in the 1990s, but isn't played too often. But he goes on to say that there aren't really, there isn't really a reason for that. It's still plenty good for black. Uh, in particular, I remember several Kramnik games in this line where he was playing white. And what happens is after e6, white will play this f3 move, or they typically do if they're looking for an advantage. That was one of the uh, perks of playing knight e5, allowing the pawn to come up here. And white is trying to be ambitious and play e4 and crowd black in the center. And the theoretical battleground in this line is black playing bishop b4, again, getting this bishop to this nice square, e4. And now bishop takes e4. I always remember this. It's the bishop sacrifice line. Uh, I remember reading some slob book, and they were saying, uh, you, should, you should try to remember this line as the bishop sack line rather than just the sack on e4 line because black has a choice which way to take on e4 if they are going to take that pawn, knight or bishop. And you're sacrificing the bishop. So bishop takes e4, f takes e4, knight takes e4, pressuring the knight on c3, also opening up queen h4 check. And, okay, Tom goes into a line with queen f3 now, which um, can get quite complex. Let me see if I can show you, if we go back, just kind of one of the, the main positions. This is quite a long line, but let's just click on it. So after knight takes e4, white usually plays bishop to d2. And this allows queen takes d4. So now black has three pawns for the piece. White takes on e4. Black plays queen takes e4 check. Queen e2. Bishop takes d2 check. King takes. Queen d5 check. King c2. Knight a6. And this is what you see out of this line. So if we count up the material, uh, black is down a piece but has three pawns for it. And you could claim that white's king is a bit exposed. And there's been many, many games to be played uh, that have been played from... Uh, this material imbalance. And I think it's a robust position that you could legitimately play for either side. So if you're looking to spice up your repertoire a little bit in the Slav and take on a little bit more risk, but have more winning chances as a result, this is a line that Tom goes into great depth explaining. Maybe if we can fast forward, you can kind of just see uh, the gist of what Black hopes to do later. Yeah, Black ends up pushing this pawn mass and trying uh, their best to kind of quell white's activity with the extra piece. Those pawns can be pretty potent, though, in the endgame.
So I really like that aspect of Tom's repertoire that he does give two options against that critical knight e5 move on move six. So the solid Sokolov line with knight bd7, knight b6, and also that peace sacrifice line. And also probably just worth exploring what Tom recommends against the English. So he says, uh, you know, unlike a lot of Slav books, which just exclusively cover the Slav, he wanted to show you how the Slav can fit in globally in your repertoire, basing it around c6. So against c4, you can totally play c6 on move one. If white plays d4, then after d5, it'll transpose into a normal Slav. Hence, white usually plays knight f3 or this other move e4, which Tom cover covers as well. Also worth pointing out, if white starts with knight f3, then black can play d5. Knight f3, d5. White doesn't have a pawn that would influence the d5 square yet, so we're completely good to play this. And very popular these days is g3, c6, bishop g2. So this is another Slav-like position that can arise. So he doesn't leave you hanging about what to do against knight f3 or c4 on move one. And finally, this chapter 11 is on these side systems. So like what to do against this Trumpowski or pseudo Trumpowski, I've heard it referred to as, where white brings the bishop out to g5 very early on. And he's recommending, no surprise here, an early c6. I've also played this before. Black can try to pop the queen out to b6 early on in this line. Black has no problems. And also against the London, he uh, recommends a pretty topical system, I would say, where you're playing for a quick c5. Since white is not playing for c4, I think it does make sense for black to play c5, put pressure on the center, and after developing, put the queen on b6. So in this line, you're not putting the pawn on c6, you're being a bit more aggressive in playing c5, but theoretically this line holds up very well for black too. I have some games on my channel where I played this from the black side. So that is the gist of the repertoire, the practical Slav defense. It is not on sale yet as of the time of making this video. I think by the time you guys watch this, it will be for sale, probably at a price of $11.99 USD. So if you're interested in the Slav or you like C6 and you could see that as forming the basis for your repertoire, I think you'll be very happy with this offering from international master Tom Bartel. So anyways, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you guys again shortly. All right, bye guys.